días a todos. Eh, la Suprema Corte de Justicia, el Centro de Capacitación y la Facultad de Derecho de la Universidad Nacional de Cuyo. Hemos organizado este gran evento. Realmente entendemos a la doctora Alexis eh, en Mendoza. Es un verdadero lujo. Primera vez que visita Mendoza y primera vez que lo vamos a, a escuchar en, en vivo y en directo. Eh, Doctor Fernando va a hacer la presentación académica, de todas maneras, fundamentalmente, darle la bienvenida y lo hemos esperado con el distinto sonda, pero también con la calidez de los mendocinos que tenemos aquí en Mendoza. Bueno, buenos días señores miembros de la Suprema Corte de Justicia de la Provincia, señor Ministro de Gobierno, autoridades judiciales, pero de, de la universidad, funcionarios de otras universidades, señor decano de la Universidad de Mendoza, eh, y profesionales eh, inquietos por el derecho. Quiero hacer un breve agradecimiento a la Corte, a la Escuela de Capacitación e Investigaciones científicas, Manuela Sáez, que eh, eh, coordina el doctor Fernández Clares, este, y a la vinculación que académicamente se enriquece entre el Poder Judicial y la Facultad de Derecho de la Universidad Nacional de Cuyo, cosa que para la universidad es muy importante. También al doctor Manuel Adaro, como egresado de nuestra casa de estudio, que fue Nexo y fue una de las personas que intervino en la materialización de esta organización de la Corte de la Facultad de Derecho. Es un verdadero honor estar acá. He presentado a muchas personalidades en la Universidad Nacional de Cuyo, pero como esta, en esta especial día, en esta especial jornada de tener acá en Mendoza una figura mundial, como es el doctor Rovira Lexi, pocas veces, pocas veces creo que tenemos la oportunidad de hacerlo. El profesor Alexis va a disertar sobre la, la legitimación social de la justicia en los estados de derecho moderno. Podríamos decir que Alexis, más que un brillante jurista alemán, como suele decirse en las biografías que uno estudia, es un jurista del mundo. Es catedrático de Derecho Público de la Universidad de Christian Albrecht en Kiel, nació en Adelbar, Alemania, y estudió Derecho y Filosofía en Göttingen. Lo tinga como lo solemos decir en Canadá. Recibió en 1976 eh, su doctorado bajo su famosa tesis, la teoría de la argumentación jurídica, y en 1984 escribió su reconocido libro, La teoría de los derechos fundamentales. Es catedrático de Derecho Público y Filosofía del Derecho en la Universidad de Chile y es doctor honoris causa por la Universidad de Alicante en el año 2008. Para muchos, la definición del derecho de Alexi se presenta como una posición, podríamos decir, intermedia entre el normativismo de Kelsen, con una mayor influencia del positivismo jurídico, y el naturalismo jurídico de Rambos. En un interesante trabajo de Miguel Carbonell, Carbonell dice que Alexi es un autor indispensable, indispensable para nuestro tiempo, para nuestro tiempo contemporáneo. Se trata de uno de los teóricos del derecho más importantes del mundo en la actualidad y gracias a sus trabajos han tenido una repercusión mundial sus opiniones y sus preceptos acerca de la argumentación jurídica, de los derechos constitucionales y de la filosofía del derecho. Sus principales libros han sido traducidos al castellano y eso es un aporte de gran importancia que hemos tenido en todo Iberoamérica, que han sido leídos a propósito muchas veces por la escuela mexicana, que aquí los ha traído, y por los catedráticos de la eh, Universidad de Alicante, como fue el doctor Manuel Atienza e Isabel Espejo, quienes lo han traducido. Luego Garzón Valdés en la, eh, tradujo la su teoría de los derechos fundamentales y también Carlos Bernal Pulido que ha escrito mucho sobre el profesor Alexis y podríamos decir que Bernal Pulido se encuentra entre los mayores expertos de la obra de Alexis y uno de sus más entusiastas difusores por América Latina. 
Alexis es conocido sobre todo por su original concepción de los principios de la argumentación jurídica y por su compleja y muy profunda teoría de los derechos fundamentales. En su libro de los derechos fundamentales, Alexis hace una categorización de las normas jurídicas redactadas en forma de principio, que ha tenido gran éxito y se ha difundido ampliamente. Para Alexis los principios constitucionales son mandatos de optimización que ordenan que algo sea logrado o maximizado de la mayor medida posible dentro de las circunstancias fácticas y jurídicas existentes. Muchos teóricos del derecho, incluso por distintos tribunales constitucionales, suelen citar a Alexis en sus sentencias, en Colombia, Brasil, Ecuador y México. Podríamos decir, dentro de la filosofía jurídica, que junto con Roland Borges, Luigi Ferraioli, Alexi en este momento ha construido en los años recientes representaciones importantes dentro de la teoría constitucional, de la mejor teoría constitucional. La teoría brevemente de la argumentación jurídica es en la teoría donde se encuentran las claves suficientes como para poder hablar, culpa, perdón, poder hablar de una verdadera teoría que explique el origen, la validez y los límites del hecho jurídico desde una triple vertiente analítica, normativa y descriptiva. La, la teoría pretende superar las carencias del positivismo jurídico a la hora de abordar los problemas de la sociedad actual, siendo su objeto la elaboración de un procedimiento que asegura la racionalidad en la aplicación del derecho. Metodológicamente la argumentación jurídica puede concebirse como el lenguaje del derecho resultante de la aplicación actual de reglas y principios a la solución de conflictos prácticos que la sociedad se plantea en el ámbito del derecho. El autor la concibe desde una triple perspectiva, racional, práctico, moral, moral y jurídica. La argumentación jurídica puede ser considerada como un caso especial de la argumentación práctica general y subordinada a la ley, la dogmática y el precedente. Sobre los derechos fundamentales debemos decir que el sistema jurídico que contiene postulados morales fundamentales que adoptan las formas de derechos fundamentales. En ese equilibrio encontrado entre moral y derecho, con aquellos que cuestionan que la moral pueda ser aceptada en una forma eh, directa y exclusiva por todos, desde ese lado las libertades garantizadas mediante los derechos fundamentales impiden que se pueda ir muy lejos de la identificación del derecho con convicciones morales no compartidas por todos, como decíamos recién, pero cuya aceptación no puede ser pretendida por todos. De esta manera, el Estado Constitucional Democrático trata de resolver la vieja relación de tensión entre el derecho y la moral. Finalmente, quiero citar eh, algunas expresiones que el propio doctor Alexis eh, le confesó, podríamos decir, en una entrevista muy linda que está publicada en la Universidad de Alicante a Manuel Atienza, que es su traductor. Él confesó que mientras estudiaba Derecho, estudió también Filosofía. Estudió al mismo tiempo, no dejó de estudiar Filosofía mientras estudiaba Derecho. Le interesaba la Filosofía. Y dijo en esa entrevista el profesor Alexis, quien estudia a un tiempo Ciencia Jurídica y Filosofía, llega pronto por sí mismo a la Filosofía del Derecho. Ha llegado como una consecuencia natural ha arribado a la filosofía del derecho por haber estudiado al mismo tiempo que estos dos vectores. Ese interés ha permanecido en él durante toda esa época de estudiante y dice en esa entrevista que debe agradecérselo a sus profesores. Y ahí nos cuenta brevemente que tuvo la suerte de encontrarse desde el comienzo con Gunther Panzing, con el solo con el que se aprendió a familiarizar con la lectura de los grandes filósofos y de la filosofía analítica y dijo que ahí aprendió que también ambas cosas resultan de provecho propio dice por último que la filosofía del derecho ha sido su profesión ¿eh? y siempre se ha sentido satisfecho de haber tenido esta profesión de la filosofía del derecho y su confesión podríamos ser más íntima y esto creo que es realmente extraordinario haber dicho que nunca se ha aburrido con su profesión Excelentísimo profesor, lo importante van a ser sus palabras. Hasta acá llego, he querido hacer una muy sintética presentación de su pensamiento. Y podríamos decir, como cierre, si me permite, e improvisando un alemán: Herzlich willkommen, einen schönen Aufenthalt in Mendoza. Un fin de alemán. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind introduction.
introduction. It is an uh, honor and pleasure for me to give this day to you a lecture with the title The Real and the Ideal Dimension of it. Does law have an ideal dimension? Or can the concept and the nature of law be completely grasped by considering the real dimension alone? The dual nature of these which stands at, in the center of my new philosophy, sets out the claim <coughs> that law necessarily comprises both a real or factual dimension and an ideal or critical one. The factual dimension um, concerns law as fact, that is, as social facts. The social facts to which it refers are authoritative conditions and social debates. The idea that mention refers to correctness, primarily to moral correctness, that is to justice. If one claims that social facts alone can determine what is and is not required by law, this amounts to the endorsement of a positivistic concept of law. Why? Moral correctness or justice is added as a necessary third element. Everything changes fundamentally. A non-positivistic concept of law emerges. Thus, the dual nature thesis in setting out the claim that law necessarily comprises both a real and ideal dimension implies non-positivism. Section 1. The claim to correctness. The Archimedean point of my thesis that law necessarily has an ideal dimension is the argument from correctness. The argument from correctness states that individual legal norms and individual legal decisions, as well as legal systems as a whole, necessarily lay claim to correctness. The necessity of raising this claim can be shown by demonstrating that the claim to correctness is necessarily implicit in law. The best means of demonstrating its necessity is the method of performative contradiction. An example of the performative contradiction is the fictitious first article of a constitution, say of the constitution, the new, the new constitution for Germany, for Argentina, um, the first article which reads Germany or Argentina is a sovereign, federal and unjust republic. It is scarcely possible to deny that this article is somehow absurd. The idea <coughs> underlying the method of performative contradiction as applied here is to explain the absurdity as stemming from a contradiction between what is implicitly claimed in French <coughs> constitution, namely, namely that it is just, and what is explicitly declared, namely that it is unjust. Now, justice calls, counts as a special case of correctness. For justice is nothing other than correctness of distribution <laughs> and compensation. Therefore, the contradiction in our example is not only a contradiction with respect to the dichotomy of just and unjust, but also a contradiction with respect to the dichotomy of correct and incorrect. What is more? 
in the aforementioned example of the fictitious first article of the Constitution, the contradiction that arises between what is explicit and what is implicit is necessary. To be sure, it could be avoided, the contradiction, if one were to abandon the implicit claim. But to do this would represent a tradition, transition, a transition from a legal system to a system of naked power relations. In other words, to something that is necessarily no legal system at all. Section two. Section the necessity of the real dimension of law. A closer analysis of the ideal dimension of law presupposes an analysis of the real dimension. Here again, the concept of necessity is the stage that the starting point is an idea of pure ideality. A purely ideal system of reasons for action would be a system based on nothing other than moral and traditional reflection, rational, practical discourse, and spontaneous compliance with the results of reflection and discourse simply owing to their correctness. Such a system would be deficient for three reasons. <laughs> the first is a problem of practical knowledge, as John Rawls. There are a great many practical questions in which no agreement can be arrived at, not even between reasonable persons. That makes legally regulated procedures necessary, procedures that guarantee the, the arrival and the decision which determines what the law is. This implies the necessity of all objective issuance as social fact. The second reason is that spontaneous compliance, compliance is not enough. If everyone could violate the rules authoritatively issued without any risk, the rules would lose their social efficacy. Therefore, their enforcement is necessary. This necessarily includes coercion, incorporating it into the concept of law alongside correctness, determination, and enforcement are to be completed by means of a third reason. Numerous needs and purposes cannot be satisfied by spontaneous action alone. Organization is necessary, and organization presupposes law. For these three reasons, the deficiency of the ideal dimension if conceived as a purely ideal system of reasons for action, leads to the necessity of positive law. That is, to the necessity of the real dimension. This necessity, however, does not stem from positive law. It stems from the moral requirement of avoiding the cost of anarchy and civil war and achieving the advantages of social coordination and cooperation. Chapter 3. First order and second order correct. One might assume that the necessity of positivity implies positivism. This, however, would be incompatible with the claim to correctness. To be sure, 
The moral necessity of positivity implies the correctness of positivity. But the correctness of positivity does not by any means imply that positivity is to be understood as having an exclusive character. Would be to fail to take account of the fact that the claim to substantial correctness, first and foremost, the claim to justice, does not vanish once law is institutionalized. It remains alive, standing behind and count in the law, and, is, and it is the main task of the theory of the ideal dimension of law to make this explicit. In order to achieve this, one has, has to distinguish two stages or levels of correctness. First, order of correctness, and second, order of correctness. First, order of correctness refers only to the ideal dimension. It concerns justice as such. Second order correctness is more comprehensive. It refers both to the ideal and to the real dimension. This means that it concerns justice as well as legal certainty. Legal certainty, however, can be achieved only by means of positivity, that is, by determination, enforcement, and organization. In this way, the claim to correctness, qua second order claim, necessarily connects both the principle of justice and the principle of legal certainty with law. The principle of legal certainty is a formal principle. It requires commitment to what is authoritatively issued and socially efficacious. The principle of justice is first and foremost a material or substantive principle. It requires that the decision be morally correct. Both principles as principles in general can collide and say of do. Neither can ever supplant the other completely, that is, in all cases. On the contrary, the dual nature of law requires that they be seen in correct proportion to each other. Thus, second order correctness is a matter of balancing. This shows that balancing has a role to play not only in the creation and application of law, that is, in legal practice, but also at the very basis of law. It is, balancing, a part of the nature of law. And now we have chapter 4 with the title, The Ideal Dimension Pentagon. Now we are ready to give a closer determination of the relation between the real and the ideal dimension of law. In order to do this, we have to answer five questions. First, is there an outermost border of law? Second, is legal argumentation based exclusively on authoritative reasons or does it also include non-authoritative reasons? Third, what is the relation between human rights and legal systems? Fourth, is democracy to be understood exclusively as a decision procedure or also as a form of discourse? Fifth, do legal systems comprise only rules expressing and real art? 
or also printed expressing an ideal ought. These five questions shall be answered with the following five theses. The first with the Rathbruch formula, the second with the special case thesis, the third with the thesis that constitutional rights are to be understood as attempts to positivize human rights, and fourth with a deliberative model of democracy, and the fifth finally with principles theory. <laughs> That this balancing leads to the result that 
below the threshold of extreme injustice, legal certainty takes precedence over justice. Above the threshold of extreme injustice, however, justice takes precedence over legal certainty. Second, the special case thesis. Special case thesis. The second field in which the second field in which the real and the ideal dimension of law are connected is legal argumentation. This connection is expressed by the special special case thesis. This thesis states that legal argumentation or discourse is a special case of general practical argumentation or discourse. Legal discourse is a special case of general practical argumentation or discourse um, because it is committed to, we have talked about it, statute, precedent, and legal dogmatics. These requirements represent the real dimension of legal discourse or argumentation. The ideal dimension comprises general practical argumentation. Habermas has argued against the special case thesis that it represents, I quote, a blanket permission to move in the unrestricted space of reasons, of general practical discourse. My reply is that the special case thesis includes a prima facie priority of authoritative reasons. This prima facie priority which is a necessary element of second order correctness, finds inter alia its expression in the following rule of legal discourse. The rule is arguments which give expression to a link with the actual words of the law or the will of the historical legislator take precedence over other arguments unless rational grounds can be cited for granting precedence to the other arguments. The structure of this rule is quite different from that of the Rappo formula, but its function is the same. Both serve to determine the relation between the real and the ideal dimension. Third, human rights. The third area in which the relation between the real and the ideal dimension is of pivotal importance is the field of human and constitutional rights. Human rights are characterized by five properties. They are, first, moral. Second, universal. Third, fundamental. And fourth, abstract rights. That, fifth, take priority over all other norms with respect to their moral validity. Here, only the first of these five properties is of interest, the moral character of human rights. The moral character of human rights consists in their having qua moral rights only moral validity. This means that human rights as such belong exclusively to the ideal dimension of law. Now, a right is morally valid if it can be justified. 
rights exist as norms in general <coughs> if they are valid. Thus, the existence of human rights depends on their justifiability and on nothing else. And they are justifiable on the basis of discourse theory. In contrast to this, constitutional rights are part of positive law, namely positive law at the level of the constitution. As such, they belong to the real dimension of law. The relation between constitutional rights and human rights, however, belongs to the relations between the ideal and the real dimension of law, because the claim to correctness, again, the claim to correctness um, establishes a necessary connection between human rights and constitutional rights. Constitutional rights interpretation depends on the understanding of human rights and catalogues of constitutional rights may even be corrected on the basis of human rights. Four, democracy. Democracy at one and the same time can be considered as a decision procedure and as an argumentation procedure. Taking decisions in the manner familiar with the majority principle is a real side of democracy. Argumentation as public discourse is necessarily connected with the claim to substantial correctness For this reason, it is the ideal side of democracy. The only possibility for the realization of second order correctness in political life, especially in public lawmaking, is the institutionalization of a democracy that unites both sides. This, the name given to this unity is deliberative democracy. There exists a tension between democracy on the one hand and constitutional rights and the special case thesis on the other. This tension can be resolved if judicial decision making, especially constitutional review, is conceived as an essential essentially argumentative representation of the people. My last point, principles theory. And again, the implication by the claim to correct. It's the Archimedean point, as I said at page one. Now, in the application of law, rules as well as principles play an essential role. Rule express a definitive or real art. Principles, a prima facie or ideal art. The principles of a legal system taken together constitute what might be called a world of the ideal art. The theory of principles attempts to develop on this basis a theory of proportionality that connects balancing with correctness. The nucleus of this theory, principle theory, are the two laws of principle theory, the law of colliding principles and the law of balancing as elaborated by the weight formula as well as the rules connecting these two laws. Thank you very much for listening.